Good evening and welcome to the regular meeting of the Dana School Board for November 13th. We do have a quorum this evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order. First item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes for the uh, special meeting of October 22nd and the regular meeting of, of October 22nd. May I get a motion please to approve those minutes? So move. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve the meetings of the special meeting and regular meeting both held on October 22nd. Any additions or corrections to those minutes as written? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving those minutes as written, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, have we, do we have any members of the audience who'd like to speak this evening, Julie? Not this evening. Thank you. Uh, we have a recognition tonight. I named the 100, among the 100 best communities for young people. Rick? Uh, it is a wonderful honor. It's a repeat. And uh, I'd ask Julie and her team to come forward as we uh, formally uh, receive the recognition. Uh, and Julie Baskin, uh, Rogers Baskin, I always do that to you, Julie, I'm sorry, is kind of one of the champions, but there were several champions who helped shape this award for us and uh, did the recognition. Uh, we are being recognized by American Promise Alliance as being named uh, am among the America's 100 best communities for young people. Um, Julie, tell us a little bit about what does that mean and how that all transpired. So a little bit of the meaning behind the award, if you would. America's Promise Alliance is an organization that recognizes communities that support our young people. And they have a criteria of five, um, five elements that if kids, if a, if a community has four of five of these elements, it's a place where kids can be successful academically, civically, and community-minded. One of those is um, effective education. One of those is uh, safety, pl safe places. Another is um, a healthy start, a place for kids where they, where they are healthy, where they have good medical care, uh, caring adults, and opportunities to help each other. And I think that Edina has showed with the collaboration of all of our partners a way that we have uh, provided that for our young people. So why don't you introduce some of the, the partners that are here today, then their, uh, their tie back to the award. Uh, first, we have Heather Hain Anderson, and Heather is executive director of Connecting with Kids. Connecting with Kids is an organization that's a sort of a clearinghouse and a supporter of all the kinds of programs that we have for our young people in um, in Edina. Then we have Lori Syverson. She's chamber. Um, uh, she's executive director of the chamber. Uh, we're thrilled to have her on our team, and the chamber is very involved. Business community is very involved with. Uh, their concern about our young people, that this is a good place for young people to be. Next to Lori, we have Dick Crockett. Dick Crockett is executive director of the Edina Community Foundation. And the Community Foundation, um, it aims to make the community a premier place for living, learning, raising families, and nurturing leadership through a strong philanthropic program. And next to Dick, we have Scott Neal. He's the city manager of Edina. Without our, this partnership, we would not have received this award for the third time. So let me just quickly go down the line and ask one quick question of everybody. And that question is, uh, what's that pride point for you as you think about us being recognized among the 100 best communities? When you think of Edina and being at that level, what's a pride point for you? Heather? The pride point for me is I have three children, two of whom have graduated from Edina. One is still a senior. And my oldest child says that she would love to live in Edina, no matter where she is, how old she is, as long as it's further south, where it's warmer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lori, we welcome you to the community, but uh, your, your quick thought on it. <laughs> well, representing the business community here mm -hmm. in Edina, I feel that all of our members would agree that in order for us to have a strong business community, we have to have a strong community foundation across the board, whether that be through the school system, through the city, for the community organizations, such as the Dyna Community Foundation, we can't be strong as a business community unless we um, have a strong partnership. Thank you. And Dick? The foundation thrives, exists on the basis of collaboration with other organizations. We can't do much by ourselves. So this tells us that our collaboration with the school district, with the chamber, connecting with kids that we host and with the city, it's all working just exactly the way it should. Scott Neal, what's the highlight point for you around this award? Well, it's always good to get an outside validation of something that you strive for and you think is true, right? And so when you have somebody that has a 
national scope and national presence give you that outside validation. It uh, tells us we're on the right direction. Well, I thank you for coming tonight and uh, congratulate you for your role that you've played in us being one of the 100 best communities for young people. Thank you very much. Thank you all, congratulations. Next up we have our teaching and learning operational plan and secondary study report. Welcome Randy Smazel to the stage and Randy's gonna again give us a quick flyover of uh, just some of the directional work that's happening mm -hmm. uh, in teaching and learning uh, and the work and how that aligns to our strategic plan and then zero more closely into as we start looking at planning for next year on our course options and uh, the work we're doing with that. Welcome Randy. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Meyer, uh, Superintendent Dressen, School Board members. I'd like to take a few minutes and talk to you about three items tonight. Some secondary course proposals or changes that we are bringing forward to the board this evening for discussion. Uh, we will return in December with these items to the board for action. Also talking about our teaching and learning plan. It says three-year plan. It should actually say year one of three-year plan get into that a little bit, and then um, an update on our secondary academic program study. The focus of our program study is to define what does that next vision of Edina secondary public education look like in 2015 and beyond. As we listen to the recognition for Edina being one of top 100 best communities across the nation, those pride points around children and strong partnerships and collaboration between business, city, and schools, that's really the essence of what we're looking at in that secondary study, is how can we increase partnership? How can we really promote and enhance the quality of education at the secondary level um, for, that, for that future generation? So our first item looking at course proposals and changes. As we headed into that secondary study, we kind of put a pause on new course proposals. Uh, knowing that things are going to change down the road per this vision that gets described, we decided that at that point we would just put a pause on these new courses, but then as we got further into the process realized there's probably some immediate needs that need to be addressed. So some of our criteria involved trying to identify what immediate need is being served. Some of the courses that were brought forward through that proposal process fall under the framing work that's being done as part of that secondary program study. So we ask those folks, these are great ideas, but we ask those folks to just put those on hold for right now until we get the more of that work framed up around what that future of, again, Edina Public Education at secondary looks like down the road. And then there are a few courses that, based on viability, uh, past enrollment for the last three years, we are bringing to you saying, you know, at this time, those courses are probably a drop off our, off our registration guide. And, and some of those at times do present scheduling complexities. So these are recommendations for approval at the middle school level. These are subtle changes for this particular one, but for social studies six, seventh, and eight, we're looking at a course description change to align better to state standards. Um, a more significant change is adding a project lead the way course called green architecture. Um, this particular course is actually a replacement for another course. At the middle school level, the project lead the way version at the middle school level is called Gateway to Technology. Uh, that curriculum involves uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and this particular course has an enhanced math component. Now thinking about um, uh, the, the efforts that we're doing around closing the gap, the efforts that we're doing around trying to raise our math scores district-wide, knowing that we'll be looking at uh, this tech and video production course as needing new computers down the road, do we continue to invest in that course or do we invest in the green architecture course and we're, we're still discussing, you know, if that is the best name for that course, uh, but at this time that's what has been brought forward. But 
do we invest in the the computers for tech and video or do we put those into this new green architecture course and and the proposal is that we we invest in a different direction so it's a it's a course replacement essentially at the high school level um, we would be changing a course description for digital photography changing a prerequisite again a minor change concert orchestra would be a new course that would help us create an identical level structure that's used in choir and band. There's a three level structure in both choir and band and currently a two level structure in concert orchestra and or in orchestra. And concert orchestra would be the top of that third level that we would then be adding. So it's not a, it's not a cost um, to us really, it's just how we organize the students in our levels in orchestra. Advanced Algebra, again, a course a description change to better align to the math standards. Also at the high school level, looking at standard statistics, again, a course description change, better alignment to our current math strands. Advanced Placement Calculus BC, um, we have many twice accelerated students that enrolled in Calculus AB this year. What we are proposing is that these students, as seniors, would take Calc BC. Calc BC is a full year course, Calc AB is a full year course. But as seniors, those students would have already had much of the content from Calc AB. So in essence, what we're proposing is they would audit the first half of the BC course they would get credit, but they would take that as a pass-fail. And then they would be um, experiencing that new content in the second half of Calc BC. The other option is that students are in a blended learning environment, and they have the option of moving in and out of the first half of Calc BC as they work on a community-related mathematics problem. Um, that opportunity might exist through a partnership with Hennepin County. And what we would do is we would propose both options to the students and allow them a choice in, in how they would like to proceed. So again, the first option is those twice accelerated students who have had Calc AB would join Calc BC, audit the first half of the course, take a pass-fail as a grade, or they would join Calc BC, attend the first half of the course as necessary, and then work on a community-related mathematics problem. Uh, if they take the blended learning option, we would propose that they earn a letter grade in addition to credit. If they do the audit, they would earn the credit and a pass-fail grade around that course. So I'll certainly take questions um, as we move forward if, if that is unclear. Then we are also proposing for French 4, advanced placement French language and culture and pre-advanced placement French language and culture, just course description changes. The significance of those changes are that it would allow immersion students in French to take AP French prior to their senior year it would also allow students who are non-immersion to get to AP French by their senior year. So those changes in the prerequisites um, more streamline the flow in the French courses to allow those two options. Randy? Yes. Could Virginia? you describe how the French AP curriculum as proposed aligns with the AP options for other languages? So it would be more comparable now with these changes to uh, our alignment with other languages. So students would, who have not been in immersion in French would be able to take AP prior to graduation just like they can in other languages, where currently that is not the case. They don't get to that um, upper level. Can we go back to the calculus as Absolutely. Going to take questions now? Sure. I know that we talked in teaching and learning that one of the things we were thinking of doing is looking at the whole pre-calc, calc, 
because this course is geared just for twice accelerated students to look at Correct. whether we're meeting the needs of other students with the pre-calc um, calc sequence. So as part of this process, um, this would um, uh, address some needs that we have immediately for some students that are in this situation for uh, next year. We anticipate that down the road we'll have some other students that will similarly be in this type of situation. So we need to take a long-term look at that math sequence and that math program as students flow from the middle school into the high school, including looking at pre-calc, um, the calculus AB, and the BC as well. Uh, recommended courses to drop at the high school level include individual fitness and dual sports and personal fitness and wellness. Both of these have been uh, non-viable for the last three years. They have not uh, received uh, sufficient enrollment to run. And uh, I believe part of that is believed to be that the content or the opportunities that these courses would offer already exist in other FIED courses. So there's, there's probably some competition between these courses and other existing courses. And then the last one is really not, um, is not a drop, but it's a change in scheduling practice. And so the proposal is that for pre-calculus that we would not be scheduling a specific section just for 10th grade students, that that would be scheduled um, that those 10th graders may be with other grade levels in their pre-calc course. Uh, the department felt that in looking at the academic data that there wasn't sufficient evidence of benefit of just being a 10th grade um, section and it introduces scheduling complexities for those students that may make some elective opportunities difficult to schedule um, for them. So because of scheduling complexities and that, that lack of data as they presented it to us, they're proposing that we, we no longer uh, schedule a 10th grade section specifically that, but that we um, mix those students in with other grade level students who are in pre-calc. I believe those are all of the changes or um, suggestions for changes. So any other questions around those? Actually, Randy, could you yes. just ex explain a little bit further the social studies change in the middle school level? Um, you're talking about just changing how it aligns with state standards. What type of changes would that include? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, and I don't know if I'll be able to provide enough specific detail to answer that, but I'd be more than happy to send that information to the board. Fabulous. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So as we conduct this secondary study, we're going to create this vision for uh, secondary programming of the future, 2015 beyond. And we're going to need a plan, both from teaching and learning and in other areas, to ramp up to that. So as we've had discussions internally, we've talked about a three-year plan and uh, identifying, well, at least what are the components that we are doing in teaching and learning this year, knowing that in years two and three, part of that is yet to be defined, partially by what comes out of that secondary study. So I'm going to go through some elements from years one that we intend to, um, either we have been working on or continue to work on in terms of teaching and learning this year. So professional learning communities, one of our strategic directions is to advance PLCs, professional learning communities, across our system. So we started off this fall with assessing our current progress on our PLC journey. We used a rubric um, with our administrators to assess where they believe each of their buildings are at, at on these significant criteria around professional learning communities. And the, the goal is to build some shared understanding about where we are headed, where we're at, so that we can clarify what are the steps to get to this shared vision that we have around PLCs. As our administrators have continued to meet in Lead and Learn, we are using the Lead and Learn meetings with administrators as a way to model PLCs. And uh, we've had conversation to try and identify what are those, those tights in the organization around professional learning communities, those expectations that we have 
regardless of building, regardless of level. So if you walk into an elementary, middle, or high school classroom and, and collaborative teams are meeting, these are the kinds of things that they would be doing. And we worked as a group of administrators to build consensus through a collaborative process around what those expectations are. So we'll get into those in just a second. We're also looking at how we ensure time and support for teachers to meet because if those are expectations that we have for staff to collaborate, then we need to analyze the time and support that we're providing to ensure that we are providing those items uh, for them to be able to meet those expectations. Uh, and then planning next steps for training through the staff development committee, through Lead and Learn on how we get to this vision that we're setting out there for professional learning committees. So for 2012 and 13, these, were, these are the tights from a loose tight conversation around what these minimal expectations are across the system. So for example, all teachers must work on collaborative teams, so that's a tight. So no matter what level we go to, that's an expectation. And those teams operate through a common set of agreed upon norms that help guide how they interact and work with each other. All of the teams have measurable goals that they are focused on because a, a team uh, without a goal is really just a group. So part of what defines team is that they have a goal that they're focused on. Teams must be in agreement on the power standards being taught. In some areas, those power standards have been identified. In other areas, they have not. So that may be work that we need to do from the curriculum standpoint to help that process. And so once these are identified, then those are the tight expectations around curriculum. Data analysis is an expected part of team discussion. So we expect teams to be looking at student data. Uh, expectation that teams use common assessments and we didn't define how often they would give a common assessment or what that common assessment would look like but that team decides what their common assessments are going to be but that they are using them that they are to trying to determine what is quality evidence look like and do we have consensus on that that teams use multiple pieces of evidence of student learning to determine interventions and that teams use data to plan for differentiated learning with a focus on numeracy and literacy whenever that is possible. So those are some of the tight expectations that came out of that conversation with Lead and Learn. And what we need to look at next is what do we need to do as an organization to support um, these so that these can materialize as, as truly expectations across the system. In terms of curriculum, we're looking at our curriculum revision process, including um, the curriculum adoption cycle and what, uh, what content areas are up for review in what years. We're looking at how we even write curriculum through a digital curriculum writing process or a traditional process. We're looking at how we unpack standards and determine power standards how we write assessments, and then how we review materials. So just reviewing our process on that and making revisions where we feel revisions are necessary. These are some of the review areas that we are working on this year per our cycle. And we're also exploring through our secondary program study the expansion of online and blended learning. And we're in the process of, of implementing Reading Well by third grade. Um, you may or may not have seen the report that is on the website connected to the parent link which is a summary of some of the elements that we're doing to implement the Reading Well by Third Grade initiative. That report includes literacy goals, rankings in our reading performance with, our, with the, some sister school districts, um, assessments that we use, screening data that we take a look at, interventions, and then example student work is also included uh, on that web page. In terms of technology integration, we're moving the e-learning squared initiative forward with grade nine and looking at how we uh, develop online curriculum and online resources and support uh, that environment. Implementing K-12 multimedia liter literacy standards and online curriculum for grade six social studies and, and resources for grade nine AP government. We have the I-squared grants and the tech camp um, opportunity for teachers in which teachers produce a product as part of that course that is technology integration um, as an 
as an output from taking the course. And then in terms of data analysis, we're looking at our protocols and how we create and use formative and summative assessment and universal screener data. So we know exactly what data we're using to place students and how we are monitoring progress along the way. So just again, reviewing the protocols around that, that data use. In terms of assessment, grading, reporting, all very big topics, we know that there are some tools out there that may help us manage our assessment processes. So once we go through and we revise and refine our curriculum revision process, then we're gonna look at tools out there that may help support um, our assessment in our school district. We're gonna look at our protocols for how we write and administer and use common assessments and, and common assessment data. We need to look at the K-5 report card and make sure that that is matched with our language arts standards. So we have some folks working on that in December. And then long-term creating a plan for standards-based grading and reporting, which will also be part of our conversation in our secondary program study. So there, there are a lot of elements on here that relate to some of the work that we're doing this year. And much of it has been ongoing and, and we're in the middle of some of it and some of it is yet to come. In terms of instruction staff development, revising our new teacher training, um, which is called LINX. Uh, we're also experimenting with teacher performance goals around student achievement. We have about 13 or 14 teachers that are uh, um, experimenting with um, specific goals tied to how students perform on assessments. And then we have multiple trainings occurring in both for digital reading and writing for professional learning communities. And we will have trainings around unpacking of standards reading assessments, and then literacy standards being embedded in science and social studies. I'll take any questions that you have about that teaching and learning plan before maybe we, we move to secondary study. Just an update on that. Sarah? Um, could you give an example of what a, P, what a PLC will look like at the different levels, elementary versus middle school versus high school? How do you group our staff into PLCs? So there, there's lots of ways of forming collaborative teams in a professional learning community. And they could be grade level job alike teachers at an elementary level. They could be content area job alike teachers at a secondary level. There's also benefits to collaborative teams being interdisciplinary at the middle school level. So a math, a science, a social, language arts teacher, or being cross grade level at the elementary level. And so I will suspect that over time we'll have different combinations of teams occurring for different reasons at times. But as, as teachers are working, the predominant team that will probably emerge is the job alike team, because those are the teachers that are teaching the same things that you are teaching. And those are the teachers that are monitoring the learning at the grade level or in the content area that you are teaching. So purely from a teacher perspective, the job alike teachers will probably be the predominant collaborative type team that we would see in our schools. Thank you. Lonnie? Um, as I look at all of those slides about the PLC and the, the expectations, um, as we move toward common sense assessments and more use of the standards, um, are we doing anything to make sure that, that we also keep a higher level than those standards, that we're looking at creativity, that we're looking at critical thinking? I don't want to see those get lost. Yeah, I think that's a great question. In addition to, as an example, state standards, one of the things that we also need to look at are the standards around ACT at the high school level and what the expectations are for students uh, to be able to score in various ranges because those standards have high level reasoning um, that, that needs to be embedded in that student learning environment. When teachers go through the process of unpacking standards through the, the template that we've been working on, one of the elements that they pull out is the reasoning skills that students have to go through to develop mastery of that standard. 
oftentimes in education we expect reasoning, but we don't explicitly teach it. So part of our process in unpacking standards is to actually unpack what are the reasoning skills that need to be in place for students to go through this progression toward mastery of the standard. And so we're, we're trying to explicitly articulate what those reasoning skills are through this process. And at some point down the road when we have that curriculum revision process uh, a little tighter, I'd love to bring that back to the board and kind of show how we're pulling some of those things out and, and very explicitly documenting here are the reasoning skills that we're teaching um, in each of the units at each of the grade levels. Okay. Is everybody participating in the PLC at this point? All teachers, all staff, our, our, our goal is that all teachers and staff are participating in that. Um, our, I believe that is happening. I don't have data to show you that everybody is doing this, but that's the piece that we're trying to work toward is how do we collect the goals from those so that we know that they are meeting and that they have goals. Uh, our expectation is that they are meeting. We have time set aside in the buildings where either there's time set aside for them to meet or staff have said, here's when we meet, and we have collected that information. Okay. So we believe that they are meeting and that they are organized as teams. Thank you. Yep. So the last part of the presentation is around our secondary academic program study. And um, what we did is we developed a project plan around how we're gonna proceed through the study and then we define some associated tasks with each of those key milestones in the project plan. What I'm sharing with you now are what some of those key milestones are, those key benchmarks as we're marching through that project plan. Uh, the first element was to create the why around the study, which Dr. Dressen did at the beginning of the year through communication with staff, and then to develop some common vocabulary. As an example, what does personalized learning really mean? and what is included in that definition. We've added that, some of that vocabulary to our guiding change document. And then develop a communication plan for that study. How are we communicating with teachers? How are we communicating with staff internally? And then ultimately, how are we communicating this with parents and with community, which is part of this process. Initially, we've done some brainstorming and generation of ideas of what this future uh, 2015 program could look like. So we've asked s uh, staff, teachers, uh, parents, uh, community members, students through focus groups and surveys uh, about what some of their ideas are about how this could look or how this could be shaped. Uh, and we've been collecting that information throughout October. So we've we've collected information from over 400 parents, over 200 students, over 200 staff, and, uh, and, and several community groups. And we're bringing all of that information together and putting it on the table. And that is the initial brainstorming event. We also have folks from the outside, either consultants or partnerships. Uh, as an example, the Stanford online um, course through Stanford University is a partnership with the um, a prominent university to kind of crowdsource some of this brainstorming. So we're gathering input internally and externally to set on the table. We are researching innovative programs across the world. Uh, we've identified uh, a couple that are in this PowerPoint, one that we'll take a look at in a few minutes. It's a short clip, about three and a half minutes long. And we are trying to identify who's being really innovative in science and in math and language arts and in arts across the world and how can we benefit and learn from those programs. And that part is still in progress. We're gonna take all of that information and lay that on the table and bring it together and we are synthesizing it and we're trying to turn that information into options or recommendations. We're then gonna turn around and take those recommendations and options to our board, to our staff, to our students, our family, our communities through an online survey to public forums and get feedback about those options. We'll take that feedback, we'll continue to tweak or modify those options and bring those back to the board 
and then look at those options in relationship to our secondary schedule and our calendar options to see how that looks in terms of implementation down the road. Our goal is that we have those tweaked options to bring back to you in January and communication in between as soon as we begin to form those up. So that is where we're at in terms of our secondary study. Um, we've collected the input and now we're, our next step is to really bring all of that information together and start framing those options. There are, um, the first link on this slide is a school in New Zealand, a very innovative high school, a very innovative in terms of design, in terms of uh, their learning day, in terms of how they structure the learning environment for kids. Uh, Molly Schrader, our technology integration specialist here, had an opportunity to be at this school and created a screencast um, through this link that can be viewed. It's about 17 minutes long, and if the board hasn't had an opportunity to look at that, I just encourage you to, to take 17 minutes in your schedule sometime and, and take a look at it. It's, it's a very interesting high school. The second link is actually one that I received in an email about 35 minutes ago, and we threw it into this slide because this information is coming to us constantly, and we are surprised literally every hour or a few hours by the new piece of information that we've learned about somewhere, somewhere else in the world who's doing some really innovative learning environments. Well, this one happens to be right in our backyard. And this is at the University of Minnesota. I want you to think about what a traditional biology lecture classroom looks like at the University of Minnesota. And I want you to think about how many cell phone text messages would go in and out of that classroom in a 50 minute lecture and how ineffective that instructional strategy now is at the college level. And those are the words of Dr. Robin Wright at the University of Minnesota who has said, we can no longer teach the way we used to teach because students won't listen to us. <laughs> so we need to do something different. And so this is their design around doing something different for these freshman biology students. My first thought was, wow, this is really cool. This isn't like any classroom I've ever had before. When the students first walk into this classroom, uh, it sends the message right away that this is not business as usual. You walk in and there are these beautiful round tables and you instantly become part of a team and you start to be responsible to one another in that team to bring what you've learned and to teach one another. There are connections at each table that allow you to have three computers at the large table. These computers are connected to a monitor that the table owns and with just a tap of the button one of the three different computers can be displayed on that. This is my first class of the semester, and I was just blown away at this is what a college classroom could look like. The technology really enhanced it, I think, for me, because you could see what they're talking about up on the big screen. If you found something, you could show it to everyone else in the class. If I see something interesting on one of these screens, I can send it to everybody's screen. And so we're able to do peer evaluation uh, of one another's work right on the fly. There was eight of us at a table, and you were with them every day. And so by the end of the semester, you know, you were really close with those eight people, and it was great for interacting with them. I think the coursework we covered in this class was probably a little more challenging than in most classes, but the classroom definitely facilitated a much easier way to get everything done. We call this a concept laboratory instead of a lecture, and I look at it as a place where students bring what they know, what they already know, what they've learned from the textbook, and they learn how to use that to build new ideas, build new connections, build applications. One of the biggest aspects of this course was teamwork. And I think I probably learned the most from my peers, just like bouncing ideas off of each other and giving each other feedback. If you ever had a question, it was so easy to just turn and ask the person sitting next to you. 
it was a lot more friendly and open in this classroom than a normal classroom, so it was a lot easier to ask your peers for help. We all came into this classroom, we were mostly freshmen, didn't really know anybody, and by the end of the semester I felt like I knew the people at my table better than I knew anyone else. That whole feeling that when you can walk into a science classroom and there's this immediate sense of community is quite, quite special. The professor can, you know, walk around and get to each table and make sure that they interact with all the students. We're in here, I'd always be talking with the professor, asking questions, getting feedback right away. I would come over and interact with small groups of students rather than trying to present some information to large groups of students. And it surprised me how easy that was to do and how amazingly, I mean, I just, how amazingly wonderful the students were. The kinds of solutions they came up with were astonishing. I mean, I was inspired and really awed by the quality of the conversations they were having. Um, so I think it helped me really understand students in a much deeper, better way. It was an amazing experience getting to know people, getting to use higher technology, using microphones, doing things that you're really not used to doing in a classroom setting. It just made it a much deeper learning experience. So that is a freshman biology course, and it is uh, problem-based learning. The students are assembled into teams. They're given a problem. The content that they learn in the curriculum comes through those problems that are introduced to the students. So it is very different from our traditional lecture type of environment. And those are the kinds of innovative classrooms and ideas uh, that we are looking at as we have conversation around what could secondary education look like here in Edina because those are the kinds of learning environments not everywhere but those are many of the kinds of learning environments we're preparing kids for at the next level or maybe in the workplace as well so I will take any other questions or comments that you have anybody so, Randy, what are you doing to identify these other schools that might have innovative programs? I, mean, I know that we were contacted by Stanford, you came up with this, but uh, what, what activities are you engaging in to find out about other schools? So, we are researching that as a design team, so that, that's probably step one. Our design team are the secondary administrators and uh, we have some four administrators from district office here. And so one of the tasks that each person on the design team was charged with is finding an innovative school. So that was, that was part of our process. We also have kind of this ongoing search as a group that we're doing through Susan Tennyson, our strategic data analyst, and she is helping to locate those innovative schools around the country. So we're looking at um, schools that have been identified through awards, through magnet programs, through some type of recognition that has been published somewhere, so we're searching for schools like that. And in many cases, we've found some uh, local professors or consultants or community members that have been sending in email links or suggestions of other schools to take a look at. So the more that we can communicate that we are working through this process, I think that richer that uh, infusion of ideas becomes. We also are connected on a national level um, with school districts. So I was just in attendance at a national conference, which was all, uh, it was the identified as a, among the top 100 suburban school districts nationally. And so I made three or four major connections that I felt, in, especially in secondary reform, um, and have made contacts with them as, as far as some of the things they're doing. For example, the online work in math at a middle level program uh, in some of the suburban school districts in Wisconsin. We have our Project Blueprint group, which again is again a national organization, profile wells with the Diana, the first ring suburb student with a single high school, which again is important because that allows for that some of the innovation piece. So I think we have probably three or four different strategies of how we have not only going best practices, but just through our network, our current network we have in place. 
the other bonus we have is um, Susan Tennyson, who's our uh, data cruncher, a consultant in the analysis around data, um, who just came from the international schools base. So she has a strong reach with the international schools. And then, of course, Jenny Norlin Weaver, who is our retired director of teaching and learning, has a strong presence there as well. So we feel we also already have a good stretch uh, in the international schools. Uh, and so we, I think we've got a pretty good reach going on right now. And um, it will be saying, how does this data relate back to some of our core findings? I think that'll be the challenge. And uh, I can't say enough of how education is exploding with new ideas right now. I mean, it is a time of change and opportunity. Um, and everybody's looking for the ideas, the innovation piece that will align. It is really something. Fifty percent of the courses by 2016 will be online for high schools. Is what the conference was at uh, this past week. That's what you heard, heard in the suburban uh, superintendent. Yeah, fifty percent by 2016. And and that technology is going to evolve. Steve would be able to talk better to it, but we're in a very clunky stage with technology right now. If you fast forward us three or four years, I mean, it's going to be very streamlined, very virtual. Um, so again, our, our challenge is going to be to be able to plan and vision to 2015 um, because we do want to invest our resources to that direction and really make sure our young people are ready for that classroom as well as the other classrooms that are going to be. the facilities that will accommodate. That's correct. But, but you're actually going to have recommendations to us by January? <laughs> that, is, that is our goal. Yeah, broad recommendations. And, and it's going to be a three-year phased-in process so that it's a natural way we can manage because what we also don't want to do is get out in front of the headlights too far so that we need to have the training for impl successful implementation, the communication for, sex for successful implementation. So there's several components in order for us to phase it in. But our goal is and our commitment is is the next generation of Edina Public Schools 2015. January meetings will be very exciting. We're looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Pressure's and, on, Randy. And honestly, this, this has been a very exciting conversation because everybody you talk to that has an innovative program absolutely lights up with what they're doing that makes their district or their school so innovative. And to learn and engage in that kind of enthusiasm has, has really been fun. Randy. Embedded with the questions that you're asking and the direction that you're taking, is there a question about eliminating a gap and finding an appropriate match for technology for all of our learners? I, th I think that if we if we didn't address that through this secondary program study, we we would definitely would be missing a piece. So, so I think we have conversation around that, and and hopefully we have some recommendations around that. Thank you, Randy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, we have our uh, consent agenda. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Rick, could you please walk us through that? Um, I certainly will. We have our personnel recommendations uh, that will bring us forward. We have uh, our expenditures. We also have a couple student teaching agreements. Those become very important to us, uh, especially during this time of change to have that new resource, uh, additional resource available to our classrooms. They do need to meet our requirements uh, to, for being part of our uh, school district. We did have a very fun event the last night where we recognized our national merit and commended and uh, Hispanic student scholars. Um, a great turnout at that event. We have uh, the students bring family members as well as a teacher that have a significant role in their learning. And then the students one by one get up and introduce their families as well as uh, share the story of what, what impact that teacher had uh, on their learning. And it is teachers from all grade levels, uh, from all areas of content. And uh, it's just a very fun evening of recognition for the hard work our students have done, but also the recognition and the impact that our educators have on their learning. So we'll do a, some recognitions around that. We have some gifts. Again, we thank our community for their generous gifts that they uh, 
help support our school district uh, through funding, and that would conclude the consent agenda items. Thank you, Rick. Any discussion around the consent agenda? Any items you'd like to remove from the consent agenda? Seeing none, all, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The consent agenda has been approved. Uh, next item requires a roll call. It's the uh, financing of the 2013 alternative facilities through issuance of sale of general obligation alternative facilities bond series 2013A. Can I get a motion, please? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Margo, a little background, please. This is just part of the financing plan for the first year of the 10 year, uh, well, actually, the bonds will cover two years for the 10 year alternative facilities plan. This resolution is authorization to proceed. We would have pre sale analysis on January 7th and then um, uh, bond sale on January 28th. Are we, and have we gotten our department, Minnesota Department of Education approval yet, or are we still awaiting? We have not. Um, I expect it any day now. Okay. But we can go ahead and vote on this pending that. We can vote on this. We will not proceed any further with it until we get department approval. This is just authorizing, authorizing us to proceed once we get department approval. Thanks, Margo. Any uh, discussion? Questions? All those in favor of approval? No, roll, roll call. Uh, roll call. Julie, please. Walma, aye. Stella, aye. Neville, aye. Hatsula, aye. Sprenter, aye. Aye. Thank you. The motion is approved. Uh, next up, we have our employee insurance renewal. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Margo, a little more background, please. Last year, uh, as you recall, the district went out for a bid for health insurance with a with, which a two year rate was quoted by preferred one. Um, and with that came a 9% rate cap. In looking at the data, uh, preferred one is recommending a 9% increase in premiums. Uh, the insurance committee um, did or uh, was given information in terms of there still is interest to look at self-insurance. However, because we had a limited amount of time and data, because we switched to preferred one January one, um, we were not able to get uh, bids for uh, stop loss carriers for self-insurance. So that is something we'll still con consider as data comes forward, whether that's uh, viable option for the district, but for right now we are in the second year of our, our approved um, vendor preferred one and then we'll, we'll go move forward next year. Um, then uh, with the Delta Dental, we are self-insured there. There's a 0% increase. We were not required to go to bid for life in LTD and we did not, however, we did request quotes in, informally and uh, received competition there, so I'm happy to report that we will have a reduction in both of those premiums, double digit reduction in both of those premiums. And I would ask for your approval. Any additional questions or discussion? All those in favor of approving the uh, employee insurance renewal, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next up, we have the uh, Employee Benefits Consultant Renewal. Can I get a motion, please? Moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Background? This is our annual contract with Corporate Health Systems, and uh, they provide services to all our employees in term of terms of flex benefits and benefit administration. Um, they did uh, have a reduction last year uh, when the teachers group went to PEEP insurance um, there was some savings there um, and they are recommending a 2.4 percent increase which is about twenty five hundred dollars we are hoping to recoup that um, increase in savings from going to an online benefit registration system this year margo is this something that we go out to bid for on a regular basis uh, we have not since i've been here 
I believe I, I would have to look back and see when the district did, but it should be something periodically that a district would do. It's not something you would do annually because okay. you wouldn't want to change that service annually, mm -hmm. but some you know something around every five years or something like that. So I can certainly look at that. Thanks. Any questions or discussions? All those in favor of approving employee benefits consultant renewal, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Uh, next item is a pilot of video cameras on school buses. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. A uh, little background or discussion? Uh, so as the administration, we've been talking about this, again, just taking a look at saying how do we enhance the safety of the bus ride and uh, make it a, a safe ride for our students and, and uh, quality ride. Um, we have discussed and looked at what other options are, including the possibility of putting video cameras on. This was a discussion that occurred in the 90s at the school board level as well, and we chose not to, as a district at that time, pursue it. Um, we have studied a little bit more at the administrative side. I'll let Margo talk to that. The board did have a work session on this in October where we talked more about it as well. Um, and the, dis the administration is interested in, on a piloted basis, uh, seeing if this is something that would be a benefit uh, to us, um, and I'll let Margo give a little more background information on it, the, the, kind of the details of this. Uh, certainly, it's the, a safety focus in that uh, for students and the employees, uh, just the, because when we are out on the roads and driving, uh, we want our drivers focused certainly on, on the driving and the safety for our students. Um, background information is we would pilot in four buses. Um, we would uh, have those in a variety of regular routes or activity routes, a combination of all the above, and um, prepare data and measure, you know, look at the data and the surveys from building administrators and, and assess how, um, how that is working. If, if we do proceed with implementation in all buses, then we would make a recommendation more than likely of some sort of phased-in approach because there would be a cost to that. Do an RFP of sorts. Uh, right now we're able to do a pilot uh, for no cost, but certainly we would uh, want to check state pricing and it would do an RFP. Um, we have looked at other districts and the majority of our surrounding districts already have uh, video cameras on all buses. Could you give us an idea of what it might look like in terms of the, the pilot? Would we look at different age levels of the children that were moving around or different types of activities that we're moving them around for? How would we pilot this? We, what we may look at is doing, for example, an elementary route, a secondary route, and uh, activity bus, and maybe one other, something like that. And, and I don't know if there's options to rotate, but. At least so that we're getting a, a varying, and I would rely on our director of transportation, David White, to make sure that we have a balanced, um, in terms of exposure, in terms of mm -hmm. age levels, yep. uh, varying areas of the district, that kind of thing, so that we're not just focused in one area. I thought when we originally discussed this at the workshop level, we were talking about acti the, the high school activity buses, not a across the board pilot, but we were looking at those activity buses. Has the thinking changed on that? We will, we, but we also want to focus on being equitable mm -hmm. and um, being able to provide the data uh, in terms of um, student reports or not student reports, but yes. And so there may be two in the um, high school busing or activity buses. So are you saying that the activity buses will have Yes. And then what's the criteria for success? In other words, do you have data before on complaints that you're going to compare with post? We do have data in terms of, you know, discipline reports on each of the buses and work with the principal. So between the transportation department and the principals, we'd have to take a look at that. Um, it, it may be difficult to measure it in terms of it will be how does that assist when there there is an issue either with a, stu a student or a, an employee? It, does that help us in in our investigation, or does it? Are there less discipline discipline reports? So we may look at it at a combination of ways. And, and what's the cost for this? The pilot there is is not a cost, um, but 
then there would be a cost, which we would go out through a request for proposal or look at state contract pricing. That would come back after we assess the results of a pilot in a recommendation of how we, how we would fund that, how we phase that in, any of those kinds of things. And what's the length of the pilot? What's the time period? Just uh, the a month? remainder of the school year. And it would be implemented starting as when? As soon as we can get board approval and get the cameras and the buses. We'd also want to get communication well, out to communication. Yeah, yes. I, I realize this is a pilot, and uh, I would say both no on this, uh, on this proposal. And I'd like to say why um, I uh, object. I'm, I'm very reluctant uh, to treat discipline in this type of, uh, to me, is a little bit of a big brother approach. I would not think a research uh, piece on the actual uh, benefit of um, video camera cameras in terms of discipline. I've also not seen any evidence that we have increased incidences of uh, bullying or trouble on buses. So we have not, uh, at least I am not aware of the need. So I feel like going to a drastic step of putting, which will also be there will be a cost, and the cost is not necessarily just having the video cameras on the buses, but it could be also the cost in terms of the administration time, possibly to review every time that the parents will say, you know, this kid was not really nice to my kid, the, the principal will have to possibly go and watch a video uh, tape. So um, I think that there is element of cost that we are, we may not even uh, considering. I feel it's a slippery slope in terms of the approach. I would rather have an educational approach to discipline, and I have not seen uh, if we ha do have if we do have discipline issues in the school in the buses, then I would like to say, okay, we have a problem, and here are one, two, or three ways to deal with that problem. Instead of saying, we now have a possibility of doing a pilot at no cost, which will, the future obviously, will cost us money, and we're not even considering other possibilities of dealing with a problem. So these are all the reasons why I'm going to vote no for this pilot. Do we have any... Um uh, evidence from our neighboring school districts. Do any of our neighbors use video cameras on their school buses? Yes. All Which, of them? All of them. The only one that we surveyed that did not uh, is Eden Prairie, and they are phasing theirs in, and the, all their buses will have them by 2014. From a technology perspective, Steve, maybe you can help me here, but is it simply that they're going to pull a videotape out of the, the slot here at the end of the, the route, or is this stuff downloaded automatically onto our server? How, how is this handled? From what I understand, it is the uh, video is stored locally on the device, and so it has uh, a way to capture probably in a digital format, and then you can pull the chip out of that and then plug it into a computer to access the video at a different time at this point so it doesn't impact I think our network or any um, live transmission of, of data during the pilot who will be authorized to view the videotapes we would follow all the student data pri privacy rights in terms of even in any normal student discipline case we would we would follow that whether it's a paper format or the videotapes so we do would not allow others to do we know what the Minnesota law is in terms because I've seen uh, that there are some states where that is actually a public data do we know what it is in Minnesota whether uh, the videotaping is a public uh, data I'd have to research that uh, Nikki, I, I would I'm strongly sure recommend Nick, that sure, we research yeah, that. I'm sure Nikki. We'll research and uh, we'll, we'll be able to use it similar to the way we use the cameras that we currently have in the hallways or in the parking lots. So, I mean, 
but again, it's piloted. I think uh, there's some very good points being brought up here that we do need to consider and we'll provide more board, if the board would, would support this, we would provide more background before we'd implement it so we'd work out some of these details for both for the board, the uh, families, the drivers, and the students. So will all um, Edina families be notified of the pilot project? Are we notifying only the families that ride the particular buses that have the video cameras, or what is, or do we have a plan of who's being notified? We would follow district policy on that. And it so would we, work with we do need that. Uh, what we'll have to do is, again, depending on the vote, um, we'd have to have a, a, a full implementation plan. It isn't just the communication piece, but exactly how we'd phase this in, how we'd present it, uh, who would be notified, so that it is a, a transparent process. Margo, from a safety perspective, I, I know part of the reason we're looking at this is because we ask a lot of a school bus driver to drive the bus safely, do his job just driving the bus, but then to monitor all the students and the things going on behind him or her in the bus driver's seat. Is that correct? Is that part of why this that's, is being looked at? That's part of the reason, um, certainly because we want attention focused on the road. Uh, we also now are in an age where students have cell phones and then tape and make recordings themselves. And so this is a way, now that's a, a certainly not the driver of this, this initiative, but it's a way for the district to, um, then we have our mm -hmm. own data. Um, I if there is such an incident, whether it's a student rela related incident or an employee related incident. It sounds like there's a lot of questions here. If we delayed this for a month, does that have any impact? It's a pilot. You know, maybe, maybe what I would ask then, because we were hoping to pilot it this year, is that we're able to extend, depending on the data we're able to gather, that we're able to extend into the start of next school year or something like that. But <coughs> Policy was comfortable with it, or there was some questions raised, or? Uh, any comments? It did go through policy. The, for the policy of, you know, is it within our policies to do that? Yes. But we didn't talk about the communication plan because that's not part of the policy. And, and we had pretty much the same discussion in policy. I mean, a, a lot of skepticism and yet a lot of concern about what we're asking our bus drivers to do beyond driving the bus and if there's any way to help them um, that maybe this is a good thing. So I, it, the discussion tonight sounds very familiar. Well, and it seems that we, we did have this discussion at a workshop already and it's been brought to the board to be decided on tonight mm -hmm. as a pilot. Right. It seems to me that we, we are in a position to be able to go ahead and vote on this. It seems to me the critical piece is the data and how well you support whatever your recommendation is based on the pilot. I mean, the, the explanation was there's a need, there was a specific area targeted. Uh, I understand this idea of equity. I mean, I, I'm okay with it in terms of the area of the need and if you want to expand it beyond that, but I would be looking for data at the end in terms of whether it needs to be continued and at what level. Which certainly would be part of a recommendation to move, move forward or not move forward. Additional discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion carries. Uh, we've got a series of uh, purchases here. Uh, I think a motion to combine those. Uh, we have uh, items E, F, G, H, and I. Move to Second. combine E, F, G, H, and I. Move and seconded to combine. Any discussion? All those in favor of combining those motions, mm -hmm. please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Steve, you want to walk us uh, through? Shall we make a motion on the combine? Yes. Uh, can I get a motion to bring the uh, combined motion to the floor? <laughs> I'll Steve? make that motion. I will second it. <laughs> Is 
you have a motion and a second to bring the combined motions to the floor. Steve? Thank where, you. Where uh, can we have data and internet lines and yep. service from the state of Minnesota? E, F, G, and H are, um, it's E-rate season, and, and again for the uh, public, E-rate is a process that uh, the district applies for every year and receives a rebate on certain uh, internet and network services cellular service, internet service, and long distance services. Um, we're required to have an RFP and, a, and work with specific vendors. Uh, in 2010, we went out for an RFP for a two year with an optional third year on our contracts, and we were awarded our vendors. These just ask us to continue for that third year option for all of our current vendors. Uh, prices are still very favorable, um, and we continue to review them from year to year prices go down, but this just allows us to apply for our E-rate, stating that we're going to continue with our, our same vendors. And so the other option would be to go out to bid again? The, the other option, which we will have to do next year, is to go out for RFP. And at that point, again, we go out for an RFP for all these services. Uh, um, again, identify what our goals and our, our needs are, and then uh, select the best vendor that allows us that to provide those services. And we're comfortable that the, our third year option prices are still solid competitive Absolutely, prices the, the, the third year prices, these are uh, top end quotes and so a lot of it is due to how much we use and consume. So for instance, if we don't use as much cellular service, it's by the minute um, and so those prices can go down on it. And same way with internet, internet prices have been going down and our long distance ha has been going down as well. So all these are top end prices and they expect to come in under those prices. The, the difference between the data and internet lines that we're buying as part of the first resolution and then as part of the second resolution, E and F, what are the difference between those? Thank you. That's a great question. So what we do is we, we get our primary internet through uh, Office of Enterprise Technology, and that is a 100 megabit connection at this time, and it's at the same price. So every year we get more bandwidth at the same price, which is really nice. We have a redundant connection through ties. That's the second one, uh, and that allows us to have a connection to ties. It does a couple things. Uh, it provides us a redundant connection. All of our, a our ERP systems, which are our student information, financial, and HR reporting systems, we purchase as a software as a service through them. It gives us a gigabit connection to those services, so uh, that provides a more robust connection. And then finally, through having this, we get to apply for um, additional maintenance pricing on all of our bundled internet and so we end up getting a discount on that as well. So that second connection not only gets us a, a good connection but provides us additional revenue resources. Thank you. Additional questions, discussion, uh, the projectors, can you talk a little bit about that Steve? Yes, um, so as part of our technology plan and as part of the technology vision that was laid out, is a refresh or life cycle management of our technology. Our projection systems have been in place, some of them for seven, eight years. And as I've been told by a teacher, it's, the, it's their most critical piece of technology. And if it breaks and I don't fix it, they come after me with pitchforks. <laughs> and so I prefer to ensure that there's technology in place. So this is being proactive. What we plan on doing is beginning a refresh of about 25% of our projection systems with this purchase. Uh, putting those in. We won't dispose of the projection systems we're taking out, but we'll create hot swaps so that if a projection system does break down, we can quickly put a projection system in place, reducing our, our outages, if you will, for our teachers and projection systems in the buildings. Are the projectors being proposed compatible with all of our sites, or do we have differing technology in different sites that requires a different projection system? Well, I wish I could say is technology is completely 100% compatible, but that's not the case. Um, fortunately, we have worked very hard, and Al Bliss, who is uh, the technology person in our department who's in charge of AD, and I have worked closely to try to come up with our standard. What we found is this is going to meet um, about 40% of our projection, projection systems that we currently have, so it's going to be well above uh, what we can cover. Not only that is, it is in line with what we currently have, so it will fit in with our current management software, projector control software, remotes that we currently have in the buildings, and it is providing um, IP 
iPad compatibility, so now with iPads, we'll be able to wirelessly connect to these projectors. So this is starting actually to bring into a level of technology where we start seeing this world where we can wirelessly connect to our projectors and present information. So we're, we're quite excited about this, uh, the evolution of projection systems going forward. Does that wireless connection include Apple TV? Is it correct that we're using that at a couple of sites for PE? We are using the Apple TV. We, con we continue to be challenged with the um, business model of Apple technology that is very much a consumer-centric vision of it. And so how do you fit a device that works really well in a home, in an enterprise? So these will be compatible in a sense with those uh, Apple TVs in the, se in the sense that you can plug an Apple TV into these projectors and they will work actually very well. But not only that, these will provide greater flexibility so that computers can connect wirelessly, iPads, Android devices can connect wirelessly. So it's actually given us uh, greater options as we go forward. Uh, with, with the wireless technology, if a classroom wanted to do things like we just saw in the teaching and learning presentation, where say high school students were working on a project, could a student wirelessly connect with a projector to show some of the work that they're doing if there was a classroom discussion or something. You know, so just so you know that I, I always pay attention at the board meeting, but I, after I watched that video, I quickly found the YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, looked at the technology that they're using. So I, I'm, I'm very much interested in how do we allow our students to be able to create those ad hoc presentations of our technology. Currently, we're doing it a number of different ways. So I'd say we're in the disruption phase. Mm -hmm. And that is we're using Apple TVs. And so Apple TVs you allows a student to take over the projection system, if you will, wirelessly. We're also looking at uh, uh, products called Splash Top and Air Server, which allow you to use a computer and do that same type. So it's very um, experimental at this mm -hmm. point with the wireless technology. But I'm very much intrigued about what those, those um, computer tables were because the way they were working it is they had a VGA hub that all the computers connected into that and then they can press a button and their computer then was connected to their LCD screens and then I love the idea of that professor being able to then take that and say well, let's put that on all the screens and so that's a very intriguing model that we're looking at how we can turn some classrooms into that type of a, a active collaborative classroom. Uh, Steve, one, one further question on the, on the wireless uh, telephone services. Have we ever resolved the uh, issues with uh, staff being required to have a phone in their classroom versus a wireless phone? And sort of what's the status of that? Our status is every classroom has a phone in it. And the reason why we do that is uh, for uh, that hopefully unlikely uh, emergency that happened where we would need to call 911. And so all of our phones, and again, I, I, I credit Tess Stavlo out of our department, who does a great job and is very diligent of making sure that every phone, when you dial 911 on that, a building knows, or in case of emergency, we know exactly what room that's in in case there is an emergency. Whereas with a cellular phone, although you could dial 911, it doesn't have that level of being able to pinpoint where that emergency is happening. And so in all of our instructional classrooms, we do have a phone in that, and that phone's used for emergency, and it's also four-digit dialing and voicemail and things like that as well. And how are we dealing with our staff as we, as we ask them to move more and more around the buildings? Are we providing mobile phones, or how is that working? Uh, we're looking at a... a um, a menu of options and so we're all in we're very much into choice and trying to make it as easy as possible for our teachers and our staff so we have a, a menu of options so one is we have what's called a soft phone now that will fit on your phone on your computer and so if you have a computer you can actually use it as a telephone and it works with our Cisco phone our our Cisco telephones allow you to punch in your extension and then that becomes your extension so it's yours and then we also have on our iOS and Android cellular phones the ability to have your Cisco phone forwarded to that or dialed to that as well. And so it's a pretty innovative technology in the sense that you can call my telephone number and it will ring my office phone, it can ring my computer, and it can ring my cellular phone at the same time. And I can pick that phone call up and what you see 
for the caller ID is my extension at my desk, and as well as, as a, I could be at home and VPN in with my cellular phone or my computer and be making telephone calls using the caller ID and the system saving the district money on that as well. And so it's very flexible on how we offer it. We work closely with the teachers to find out which of those technologies work the best for our, our staff. Great, that's impressive. Additional questions or comments? So our motion is to, uh, to approve data internet line services from the state of Minnesota, uh, data internet line and service from TIES, uh, local and long distance telephone service, cellular service, and 100 Hitachi projectors and some parts. Any additional discussion? All those in favor of approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all. Uh, next up, we have start end times for 2013-2014. A motion? So moved. Second. So moved and seconded. We've been working on this for a while. Who wants to? Uh... I'll, I'll, I'll take a run at it. Okay. Since, uh, it uh, it's really caused by the shift that the state made uh, to create greater flexibility for schools by moving from uh, days to, to uh, hours. Uh, in doing so, um, what it created for us was uh, because of the length of our day, that we needed to make some internal shifts. Um, and it really created limitations for us as far as how we could serve our students and our staff's needs. Um, so we, like many school districts throughout the state, are adding five minutes each of our day. In that, I believe it builds like 17 hours. Is that the number I'd... 14.25 hours um, into our accountability component back <laughs> to the state. Now, I will have to say that uh, this will not impact um, bus schedules. It will really not impact learning but it's an accountability piece to the state um, so we're not changing any making any major changes uh, but we do, we do need to do that the state is in transition as well I do believe because they have not addressed uh, the flipped classroom experiences or the online experience and how we measure that and so there's a lot of transition going on but this is a good way for us to address it better meet our students needs better meet our staff's needs uh, by making this little twist in our day and so the administration is recommending this, uh, I think it was also discussed at the HR committee and we had support from the HR committee around it as well. And the uh, zero hour at the high school, is that a 7.25 a.m. start time? So I'll be a little just bit of a shift, yep, yep. That just sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so are we adding a minute to every, about a minute to every period in the high school or are we so, adding so a minute to passing time because <laughs> yeah, so, right so now? We're, yeah, we're, we're now uh, going to allow this. This will roll back out to the sites, and they'll try to make it, bring it into the instructional period versus uh, five more that, minutes five more minutes for lunch or anything yeah. like that, yeah. <laughs> Additional discussion? I just want to say, although five minutes is pretty, pretty minimal, it does remind me again as a school board member how early our middle school kids are going to school from 745 to 740 it seems minimal but it is really early in the yep. morning good point additional discussion all those in favor of approving start end times for 2013 2014 please signify by saying aye aye, aye. opposed motion carries uh, next up, we have an athletic agreement between Our Lady of Grace uh, Catholic School and Edina High School. Can I get a motion, please? Moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, anybody want to provide some uh, we, This has been our practice that we've had an uh, athletic agreement. This is required by the Minnesota State High School League. Uh, occasionally, we will have uh, students who uh, attend Our Lady of Grace, which is a K-8 building, or E-8 building, I should say, a site. Um, who want to participate in our ninth grade programming or above in the athletic world. In order to do that, we need to form uh, the, sta the Minnesota State High School League requires us to form a formal agreement. It's been our practice. We have a great working relationship uh, with all of our non-public schools, but certainly we've had a long-standing one with uh, Our Lady of Grace Catholic School, and this formalizes that process. We've already had their support, so in doing so, this uh, formalizes the practice that uh, we've had long-standing. So this allows them to um, participate on high school teams. It doesn't um, involve our middle school teams. That's correct. So is that uh, the Minnesota State High School League sponsored level? And, and if they were homeschooled, what would be the process? Then there's the same type of application process. 
Because the homeschool stands. Is there a contract then that you sign with the parent? Yep, with the parent school, yep. So the parents, that, okay. that is viewed as a school. Okay, all right. And so then they're governed by the participation policies that then we have for sports eligibility grades. That's correct. And all, all those other So the student signs the same documents uh, no matter what school they attend because they're partnering with us. And, and it is not, um, this is not a joint uh, sponsorship, so right. it isn't that it's gonna be Dinah, Our Lady of Grace, wearing on their yeah. uniforms or anything of that sort. It's They're just, they they're, have the right to participate with, that's with us. That's correct, that's correct. Yeah. Additional discussion? Do we, you know, be, because I just happen to know the seventh grader. She's a diver. She's a great diver. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, but this was never came up during her registration. And just when she was about to compete in sections is when this issue came up. Well, so so w what is the actual? The actual is that we need to have a formal, pro we've had a, an, an informal procedure. Mm -hmm. And uh, st State High School League is now recommending formal. And so. So, so our practice will be that when you register, if you say your school, you know, you, you're going to check if you're yep. a homeschool, that, that, you're going to require correct. that agreement. If you're OLG, you're going to require. Yep. Okay. And the registration requires them to fill out forms that those forms have like indemnification or releases of the district? It's the same, uh, yes, it, it's the same uh, releases that uh, the student fills out who's a part of the Edina Public Schools. Additional discussion? All those in favor of approving the athletic grant between Edina High School and Our Lady of Grace, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next up we have our scheduled review of the 200 series policy, uh, school board phase two. We have revised policy 205, 206, 207, and 208. We've seen these before. Any discussion? Or can I have a motion? I move. Second. Approval. Moved and seconded. There, there have been no changes to them since you saw them at the last board meeting. Um, okay. I wasn't here. The code of ethics, is that taken from uh, MSBA uh, pretty much? The code of ethics is, I think, the one in um, it, that's up for discussion, not for not for approval. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm jumping. In. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Sorry. Any any additional uh, discussion around the 200 series policy phase two? Seeing none. All those in favor of approving, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries. Uh, our final item this evening is to uh, uh, rescind policy 207, school board public hearings. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. moved. Second. Moved and seconded to rescind policy 207. Any discussion? That one was included in other ones, right, Kathy? Right, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next we have our discussion items. Uh, first item is course offering changes at Edina High School and courses to be discontinued at Edina High School. And we saw that earlier. Any uh, discussion? Just that we should look at on page 127 the way it looks to me. It looks like because we're talking about offering course changes, we're talking about the advanced placement BC and then it says the pre-calculus segregated 10th grade section that second one is actually we're discontinuing it and it kind of looks like we're, re, um, we're recommending that we add it. So I think that we should just be clear that that one, the second part of that is recommending that we discontinue it. We'll make mm. that change, yep. Mm -hmm. Additional discussion around the uh, courses, changes or discontinued courses? Description changes, we saw this earlier as well. And the new courses, we saw anything. Okay, we're gonna 
Anything else? Any any discussion items there around those the courses? We're on to the schedule review of the 200 series policy phase three school board. That's where I guess my question would be. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that, that is that is Yeah, I was just there. <laughs> and that is from that is from MSBA. Okay. And I think one of the biggest things there people might wonder about is rescinding policy 213.1, the authorization of the Board Finance Committee. Policy 213 covers committees totally. And so to have a, a separate policy that establishes one committee but doesn't establish the other committees seem to make absolutely no sense. And then rescinding the public access to school board data, basically that policy was just a regurgitation of state law and what's covered under Data Practices Act, and it really wasn't a, a policy so much as it was a statement of the law, and it didn't mm -hmm. seem to make sense to just restate the law as part yeah, of the policy. Okay. And, and the bottom line is that <coughs> board book mm -hmm. is public, our meetings are public, and so. It's a different time. Yeah. And, and in, individual policies where it is necessary to draw distinctions between what information is public and private. Um, we do make those distinctions within the individual policies, so it seems silly just to state what the law was. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna take another look at all of those, and I think we're gonna do a little, fine, little more tweaking and fine tuning on the grammar of some of those at our next policy meeting, so if mm -hmm. you see anything that um, offended your grammatical senses, mm -hmm. let us know. <laughs> and we've been trying to get rid of the longer sentences, you know, the, the purpose of this policy is to, this policy does something, pure and simple. And getting rid of some of the legal wherefores and mm. that kind of stuff. <laughs> Although I, I, I do like a good wherefore yeah. every once in a while, but we're trying to get rid yeah. of it. Yeah. Shocking. Mm. There's no uh, discussion items? We have some information items as well, including some policies. <laughs> Announcements? Uh, just a couple things. Um, update the board on the e-learning squared initiative. This is the bring your own device. Uh, we are razor close to uh, closing an agreement with the vending company. I'll ask Steve just spend a minute or two uh, updating the board because of the timeliness of this. Thank you. Um, I, uh, as I've mentioned a number of times, this year is a, uh, a year of learning and aha moments for me. And uh, in particular is this e-learning square. We believe we uh, are on the right path as we go forward. Uh, unfortunately, not always is the right path the easiest path to go. And so we've, we're finding it uh, very difficult to really um, figure out how we solve this issue of access to technology in a different paradigm in the, in the increasingly changing uh, paradigm of how access is provided outside of education situations. And so we continue to work very closely with uh, a vendor who is very much committed to making this work in a reality. Unfortunately, it, uh, there's a number of challenges when you work in a K through 12 situation in a business setting that we're trying to uh, mesh those two worlds together and ensure that there's equity and access for all and so that we aren't creating haves and have not but we're providing choice and we're providing opportunities where technology really becomes that exponential uh, instrument in our teaching and learning and so we'll continue to work through that uh, continue to have conversations we have another update on on Thursday and I continue to let our leadership know where we're at on that as we work through that. Uh, thankfully, I, I believe I've had the direction is is that we launch when it's ready, not when we, um, uh, not on an arbitrary date. And so I continue to do that. With with that said, I understand there's some natural timelines that we like to hit that we're going to keep moving forward. In particular, the holiday buying season. Mm -hmm. Randy, you had you had mentioned that there were additional policies in the information section and. We didn't say anything about them, but basically in policy 404, we revised the one of the appendixes that just new employees, how background checks are done, and it's just the form they fill out so that you can facilitate getting that background check. And the other one is just the appendix to 
um, our um, one of our athletic policies that deals with independent providers. Those are the, the um, sports or activities that aren't state a high school league recognized activities that they're not provided by the school, but an independent group that we partnership with. But um, if they follow all the rules and regulations of that policy, students are allowed to letter and the high school has added an additional sport. So now we will uh, have a bowling team. So we can letter <laughs> bowling at the high school. That was the other change. Thanks for the background. <laughs> Thanks for all the work the policy committee. It's yeah. extensive. Yes, yeah. mm. indeed. Oh, we have a good time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Any other uh, announcements? Um, uh, we, we've talked. I think we informally talked about setting up a workshop about how we communicate between ourselves and uh, mm. our practices and how we communicate with the public. So, is there something that we're planning to do still in 2012? We could be looking at doing in 2012 or early 2013. Those are both options that we'll uh, probably. Uh, Take a look at what board calendars look like in uh, so early. We early. Do a doodle. Yep. Okay. Just want to give the board a couple other updates. The, uh, obviously, the election results are in, and uh, we will be holding a uh, evening event with our newly elected state officials to welcome them and also talk a little bit, uh, have a discussion with them about some of our priorities and some of the good things going on and what their priorities are and how we match. Uh, we've made uh, individual outreach to the candidates already, or the soon to be elected, I guess, or be elected and soon to be positioned uh, candidates. Uh, we are moving forward with our school calendars. Uh, the board will take a first reading on that in December, uh, again, to make the board and the public aware that um, really taking a look at how we maximize our time. So in doing so, we've already approved the additional five minutes, but uh, we are also looking at uh, um, coming forward with recommendations that would be, uh, have um, both late starts and early dismissals. Um, to allow our teachers more time for planning, for taking a look at data, for improving their instruction, I believe up to uh, four uh, total uh, during the school year. Uh, but it's something that, uh, again, we'll, we'll bring formally to the board um, and then make it public so we get that public impact before the board would make a final decision. We'll be bringing this to a vote at the teaching, teaching and administrative level um, within the week. Um, the other thing is the cooperative districts are, are both on the move. Uh, we have several cooperative arrangements. Uh, one is the WEMEP, West Metro Education Program. Um, they have a meeting. Kathy represents us on that. And continue to look at a partnership with Minneapolis. I think uh, board members may be aware that uh, last year Minneapolis had made a determination that they might be withdrawing from this organization. Um, and they are now um, saying, here's how we think we could stay with the organization and we continue to have uh, our work. A lot of it's around integration and equity. Um, and so Kathy's uh, been involved with that, as, a, as, as have I, uh, in that work. The other is the Intermediate District 287, which uh, is, provides a lot of our special needs services that uh, we're not able to provide here as a district. Uh, they also provide a lot of other cooperative ventures for us, um, but they're moving into strategic planning and updating their strategic plan. And this is in a position that we still have open uh, as far as having a board rep sit on that. And we'll, We'll be looking at filling that Peyton Rob had served that position for many years and has concluded his duties. But uh, those are just kind of information updates that I thought the board would, and the public would be worthy of just being, having awareness around. Great. Thank you, Rick. Any other additional items? Uh, we didn't, uh, oh, we did touch about uh, National Merit Scholars last night. It was a great okay. event. So uh, thank them all and congratulate them all. And uh, with uh, no further comments. Uh, I'll uh, I've asked for a motion to adjourn. Moved. Second. second. Moved and seconded. No hurry tonight. <laughs> Moved and seconded to adjourn. Any objection to adjourning at this time? Seeing none, we are adjourned.